Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome to the April Design for Drupal webinar. Uh, my name is Patrick Corbett, and I am the CEO at Redfin Solutions and a volunteer here at Design for Drupal, along with Leslie Glynn, who will cover announcements in just a moment. For those of you new to Design for Drupal, we typically hold an annual summer event in the Boston area devoted to Drupal design, UX, and front-end development, as well as the business and process challenges facing Drupal teams. This year's event was in person at Salem State Univers University, which was a huge success, and we had a great time seeing everybody there. Uh, for our annual conference later this year, we'll be joining forces with our friends at NEDCAMP, uh, another Drupal-focused event in the fall that we'll cover in just a moment. Uh, we are also supported by a great team of volunteers, including Catherine Carruthers, who is handling our video stream currently, and Jules Iznardi, who manages our newsletter. And for now, I'll turn things over to Leslie for the announcements. Leslie, take it away. Thank you, Patrick. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, so on this slide here, there is um, a link if you want to follow these slides um, yourself. So welcome to the 15th anniversary of Design for Drupal. All right, so today we're thrilled to have Amy June Heinlein join us again. I think this is probably her third time over the last three, four years we've been doing these webinars. Always gives us excellent content. Today, she's going to be talking about Beyond 99 Red Balloons, a pragmatic guide to alternative text. There's a link there to her Drupal.org profile, her LinkedIn profile, and there is a link to the slides if you want to you know, open those up and follow along uh, there as well. So in 2023, as Patrick said, we had hosted an in-person event. Again, want to just one more time thank the sponsors, speakers, organizers, volunteers, and especially the attendees. We had a lot of people come, and that was great. The archive of last year, plus I think all the way back to 2018, can be found on the Design for Drupal website if you're interested in prior sessions or anything like that. And there's also a link to the YouTube recordings. Uh, the quarterly webinars that we've been having, typically they're on Wednesdays, but due to logistics, we had to do it on Thursday this time. There will be one more in June, I believe June 26. Tentative, it's going to be Rod Martin, um, and he will be speaking about layout builder for, for um, site builders. That's the last webinar for the, you'll notice 2023 in some of these slides. Our sponsorship goes from when we had our last um, in-person event through the year especially the digital sponsorship. So that's why you'll see that on some of these. So sign up for the June webinar. There's a link on designfordrupal.org and all the previous webinars, there's a link here to see those. Upcoming community events. Uh, the, the large one in North America is DrupalCon. It's gonna be held in Portland, Oregon on May 6th to 9th. Um, that's really exciting. Registrations are open still for that. There's a link at the bottom to get there. The new this year are some things I just wanted to mention. The regular rate right now is $895, but if you are if you work for a nonprofit, it's $395. And if you're a student or a recent graduate, um, it's only $50. So that might open that up, the opportunity for you know folks to attend that might not have been able to attend. So I, again, I put a link there to signing up. For those who want to travel internationally or, or maybe who are, are international because we get a lot of international folks on our webinars as well. DrupalCon Barcelona is going to be held September 24th to 27th. Locally, and uh, so April 12th, Evolve Drupal Atlanta, that's tomorrow I checked and registration is still open if you're in that area. Uh, May 2nd to 3rd is Stanford Web Camp. July 12th to 14th is the ever popular Drupal Camp Asheville. And the 25th to 26th is Drupal Camp Colorado. So there's a lot of opportunities there. Those are all in-person events. Uh, we sp I'm going to mention Ned Camp, New England Drupal Camp in a minute. That's going to be held November 15th to 16th. On the events page on Drupal.org, there are many, many more events that I didn't mention. All the international ones are here. So you just go to Drupal.org slash community events, and you can see upcoming camps, um, local meetups, trainings, contribution events, everything on that page. 
and that's international, every, that's global. Everybody puts their events up there. Uh, the code of conduct. So one of our great strengths obviously is inclusivity for the Drupal community. We wanna make everybody feel welcome included and respect uh, everybody. So there is a code of conduct. It's in the footer of the Design for Drupal website. We expect everybody, even though this is a virtual event, to adhere to the code of conduct. And Patrick and I are code of conduct um, contacts. If you have any concerns at all about today or during the, the webinar, we'll be watching that. All right, here we go. Exciting news for Design for Drupal 2024. We, as Patrick said, we will be combining with NEDCAMP um, November 15th to 16th at Rhode Island College in Providence, Rhode Island. There will be dedicated session tracks related to design UX front end. So the Design for Drupal camp will, will, will be held in the same location, but we will have you know, sessions devoted to things that the Design for Drupal audience are looking for, in addition to trainings and contribution opportunities. So even though it's combined, we're still gonna make sure that content and everything is relevant to the Design for Drupal audience. The reason we did this was just quite honestly, we just didn't have enough um, enough volunteers long term year you know year long to um, you know to continue with all the logistics and everything that goes into creating a Drupal camp. So for this year we're going to combine and then we'll see what happens after that. Uh, everything. So right now if you go to the Design for Drupal website, it links to the New England Drupal Camp, nedcamp.org. The links at the top of this page, that's where we're going to register, get the event information, sign up. If you, uh, you know, everything, all the links will be on the Net New England Drupal Camp website. Design for Drupal website will just link you there. Uh, NetCamp's mission, just so you know a little about NetCamp, this is their 11th year. Their mission is to grow the Drupal expertise and community in New England. Really good group of organizers. They've been together for a long time. I am and I have been for a while, you know, quite a while on the organizing committee. So I will bring the design for Drupal um, aspect to, the, to, to our organizing to make sure we cover everything. I wanna thank our 2023 sponsors. So as I said, this is still the 2023 sponsor year, um, which goes until July, which then we'll have the new sponsors, but thank you to our gold sponsors, Redfin Solutions, iFactory, After Party was Last Call Media, thank you to Keynote, was Mythic Digital, really appreciate all these digital sponsors, Dev Collaborative, Value Bound, Common Media, Lullabot, New England Drupal Camp sponsored us, Canopy Studios, and Atten. And in kind was OCO Labs, OS Training, and 108 Degrees. All right, so we are looking for sponsors for 2024. Again, go to the NEDCAMP website, click on sponsors. Uh, and there is a perspective this year that Mike Miles created that talks about all the different levels and what each one of those would give you. Uh, spread the word about today's event on social media. At the hashtag is D4D Boston. Um, and just remember to be kind to everybody you interact with. We really appreciate that on this webinar and th throughout your day. Q&A will be at the end, Patrick will lead that. So if you could put your questions, not in the um, chat, but in the Q&A tab, that would be helpful. And I'm gonna hand it back over to Patrick. Thanks again for joining everyone. Thanks, Leslie. All right, <clears throat> today's speaker is Amy June Heinlein, who is a past speaker here at Design for Drupal. And she works with the Linux Foundation as their certification community architect. She is a Drupal, uh, Drupal mentor coordinator, uh, Drupal camp organizer, a CWG community health team member. And she also serves on the board of the Colorado Drupal Association. Her ongoing experience as a hospice nurse keeps her in touch with many end users challenges. And in her continued efforts to make a difference, she helps organize Ally Talks, a online meetup that advocates all things accessibility. Uh, last but not least, Amy June, uh, along with Leslie Glynn, uh, uh, was a uh, recipient of the Aaron Winborn Award in 2021, presented annually to an individual who demonstrates personal integrity, kindness, and above and beyond commitment to the Drupal community. Uh, welcome back to Design for Drupal, Amy June, and take it away. Thank you, Patrick. That was a nice introduction. And it's good to be back. Um, <clears throat> Got to share my screen. Okay, I'm going to... I 
I never know how to make it full screen. Um, um, there's a one trick I want to show real quick. Um, that's cool. Um, I know that Zoom has captions built in, but say you're in a different platform and there's no captions or you're giving it, giving your presentation um, in, in real life. Google Slides has an option to turn on captions down here in the corner. You can choose your text size. I like to choose large and then you can uh, choose your text position and I like to have them on the top. So I'm going to toggle those on and you can see now that there are captions at the top of my screen. Um, I'm going to turn them off because Zoom has them. But why I put them on the top is when um, our videos and our webinars get um, put on YouTube. Sometimes the YouTube captions will cover these up because these are open captions and you can no longer turn these on and off, but let's toggle them off because we have them. Just a little trick I like to show people. Um, there is a lot of images, are a lot of images in this deck. Um, we are gonna talk about alternative texts. Um, most of them I will be describing, but sometimes because of the sake of learning, and you'll kind of get the drift of how I'm working it, I won't describe some images, um, and we'll have fun with those. Um, like Patrick said, I'm Amy June Heinlein. You can find me at Volkswagen Chick um, in Mastodon or on LinkedIn. I do work for the Linux Foundation. Um, I have been working there for about a year. This is my cat spot. He likes to program, he likes to type, and he likes to leave typos in his wake. So if there's any typos in this presentation, let's just blame Spot. All right. I don't want to assume anyone's level of engagement or level of knowledge around accessibility, so I want to talk about a couple of terms and definitions first. And then we'll move into image types. Uh, we'll talk about alt alt alternative text examples. And if there's a time, I have a section on um, slideshows. So terms and definitions. Um, there are many international web accessibility laws and guidelines. Um, there is a link that Leslie put um, on her deck uh, that you can follow along with and we'll put it at the end as well. Um, but we're international. So if you think about like just catering to North America's accessibility laws, you might want to kind of think about being more inclusive because, you know, we, we're a global audience now. Um, yeah, so don't just think about American kind of stuff. So we have WCAG guidelines. These come from the World Wide Web Consortium. Sometimes they're called W3C. They developed these um, guidelines to normalize how we measure accessibility. Um, it's developed with the goal of providing a single shared standard for web content accessibility that meets the needs of not only organizations, but meets the needs of individuals and governments internationally. And who are they primarily for? They're made for web content developers. They're made for our web authoring tool developers, web accessibility evaluation tool developers, and really what it comes down to is anyone who wants or needs a standard for web accessibility. And they're broken down into three different levels, A, AA, and AAA, and each increasing A indicates additional criteria to follow. Um, so we have this lower level A, it's that minimal compliance. Um, if your website or your digital assets do not meet this A level, it means that your assets are exceedingly difficult for people to use who have disabilities. That AA level indicates an acceptable compliance, which means that your website is usable and understandable by most people. But then we have that third. This is really optimal compliance, which means that your website is um, accessible to the maximum amount of users. And this can be people who live with or without disabilities. That AAA level really indicates the highest level of usability. And then um, there's certain WCAG guidelines that apply 
um, directly to images. And I'm not just going to, I don't want to just read off of the slides here, but um, we talk about non-text content. We talk about images of text. And then we talk about images of text with um, no exceptions. And these success criteria are for people who may have low vision or blurry vision, people who are blind. It could be for people using assistive technology, uh, screen readers, mobile phones, people who have difficulty perceiving visual content. Um, some of us who live in like low, low um, internet broadband type stuff, some of us even have our images turned off in our browsers. And then having accessible Images also increases um, your SEO value, search engine optimization. So a wide gamut of, of, of things that alternative texts can benefit. POR is the last definition we'll go into. It is an acronym for high level principles that describe functional accessibility. Um, perceivable means that the user can identify content in the interface by means of their senses. Operability means that a user can successfully use the controls. Um, these are buttons, navigations, and other interactive elements we might have on our pages. Our users should be able to comprehend our content and remember how to use the interface from page to page. So that falls under understandable. And the last one is robust. We should be able to choose the technology we use to interact with our websites. And not only our websites, but our online documents, PDFs, um, multimedia, um, and other informational formats. So to break it down in kind of a fun way, we want to make sure that um, we accommodate visual needs. We want to make it easy to see. Um, here we have a picture of um, Milo with his logo in the background and Milo Ackerman in the front from The Descendants. The CDC reports that 12 million people, 40 years and over, in the United States live with some sort of vision impairment, including 1 million who are completely blind. But remember, there's all sorts of things that impair our, our vision. You can have um, a cracked cell phone or maybe um, a glare from the sun. We wanna make sure that's easy to interact with. So we accommodate motor needs. You know, This could be people who live with a palsy from Parkinson's. It could be someone who's a paraplegic from something like ALS or maybe an accident. But it's also the mom on the city bus who's holding her kid with one arm. You know, She has limited mobility. Um, here we have a picture of John Cyril Adam of Def Leppard behind a drum set. He has one arm from an accident. We want to make sure it's easy to hear so we accommodate auditory needs. Um, when we address this, we help individuals not only who are in noisy environments um, or quiet environments, but we also help our deaf and hard of hearing friends as well. And you can see here we have the Beastie Boys in front of a boom box with MCA you know, doing a grand um, leap over the over the team. We want to make sure that we accommodate cognitive needs. We want to make sure that it's easy to understand. And when we think of cognitive things, some of us forget some of the basic day-to-day -day function um, that we have. Um, it could be people who are distracted. It could be people who have a difficult time focusing. It could be people who are demented with Alzheimer's. And it could be people who are depressed. So when we make our content easy to understand, we accommodate cognitive needs. And here we see Susie Sue being um, looking depressed. I worked for a company recently and I asked for accommodations on slide decks and they said I was an edge case. Um, so I like this quote that um, from Eric Meyer that says, when you call something an edge case, you're really just defining the limits of what you care about. So keep that in mind. When we make, when we make our products inclusive and accessible to everyone, um, it defines that you want to include everyone. So what's assistive technology? Um, sometimes we see it shortened as AT. <clears throat> assistive technology is something that 
allows and really empowers people who live with low vision or cognitive and learning disabilities to access information and maintain a level of privacy. Uh, it removes a barrier to the internet or digital information. You know, I, uh, it was mentioned that I was a hospice nurse for a long time. And um, there's a level of dignity that you lose when you have to have someone help you read an email. You know, you lose that privacy. So when we can use the assistive technology necessary, you know, like um, uh, a text to speech and have it on headphones, it really, you know, increases our, our, our level of dignity. Screen readers, they're used to listen to the content of the web page. You know, they convert text to speech. Um, but we also need to keep in mind that screen readers can be used along with the visuals on the page, you know, for folks with cognitive challenges. Um, right here, you can see it's a picture of a laptop with some headphones. Screen magnification software. <clears throat> It's true to its name, you know, it kind of just bumps up the font for us. And I don't know about you, but every year I have to add a little, 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 another little plus to my bump. Um, it makes it easy um, for people who live with a maybe partial sight impairment, um, maybe someone who can't find their glasses that day. Um, it also has text-to-speech functionality as well. We have alternative input devices. Um, the these are things that are not your typical mouse and keyboard interaction for users with physical or cognitive impairment. And they can include head pointers, motion tracking, eye tracking. We've got single switch devices. We've got large print and tactile keyboards. We have speech input software. Um, this is a picture of a dynamic braille machine. Um, it, it raises and lowers the dots um, dynamically as it's being read or typed. <clears throat> Something we might want to start thinking about a little bit more is virtual reality or, you know, augmented reality. Virtual reality co comes with new chances to include people with disabilities and make gaming more accessible as well. But it adds to the accessibility problems that can occur in games, you know. It's a relatively new technology. There are new rules and interaction um, forms still need to be developed, but something to keep in mind as we're learning about digital accessibility. Um, I'm gonna skip this slide. It's a lot of what I've already mentioned, um, but if you follow along at home, it's a list of more um, adaptive tools that people use. Um, WebAIM does a study every year and conducted a screen reader survey to determine how and why users use screen readers. Um, they came up with almost 88% use a screen reader because they live with a disability. And of those 88%, 71% relied on screen reader audio. So when we don't have alternative text on our images, we're leaving a lot of content behind. In that same survey, um, it was discovered that slightly more people, 51 over 48%, use a mobile app um, instead of a website to access digital information. So as we program and think about things too, we want to think about how people are using uh, mobile devices um, for their alternate, uh, for their assistive technology. So let's move into image types. Why do we love images? You know, um, images enhance our content, especially for people who live with cognitive or learning disabilities. Um, we sometimes include images in media um, that support and add to our information and concepts of what we're trying to convey. Uh, people who live with low vision use images as cues to help orient them on orient themselves on a page. Um, media, including so social media. Um, use images for conversions. And I'll talk about that in a little while. Having images on posts leads to a higher click-through click rate and return on investment. And that's why we include images a lot in our social media. So up here, we have a picture of Devo. We have some Cindy Lauper. We have a Van Halen album cover. And then we have um, the band uh, Blondie with Debbie Harry in, in the forefront. So images can be major barriers if they are not accessible. Um, accessible images benefit people who use screen readers. The text alternative can be read aloud um, and rendered as braille. 
people using speech input software. Users can um, put the focus onto a button and a linked image with a single voice command. Um, the text alternative can be read aloud for people browsing speech-enabled websites. Um, mobile web users, you know, images can be turned off, especially for data roaming and those who have poor internet connections. And again, SEO. So what are some different image types? We have the simple image. Um, it conveys simple information. We have decorative images. Um, the image is purely decorative and does not have anything informative, but I have opinions about decorative images that I'll talk about um, for a little bit. We have CAPTCHAs. Um, CAPTCHAs uh, determine whether or not we're a human using a website. We have images of text. You know, those are images of text that are displayed as text to be intended to be read. We have groups of images. Um, the text alternative for one image conveys the information for the group. We have image maps. This is an, <clears throat> excuse me, an image that contains multiple clickable areas. We have complex images. They're images that convey complex information like graphs, charts, uh, diagrams, org maps. And we have functional images. Um, they can be used to initiate actions rather than convey information. And what do we use links for? We can use them for buttons. We can use them for orientation. We sometimes use them as our logo. Um, sometimes we've linked our images. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about what a simple image is. Again, it's images that convey simple information. Um, alt text traditionally is short, sweet description of the content of an image and is typically invisible to folks who can see the image, but it's exposed to people who are using assistive technology such as screen readers or braille displays. Now on these simple images, the description should convey the content and the functionality of the image as concisely as possible to provide access to the content of the image without getting a ton of details. So here we have a picture of um, Millie Vanilli trying to look cool. An example of a simple image could be a headshot. Here we see Madonna in a headshot. Um, we want to include the person's full name, regardless of whether or not it's said in the surrounding text, please include their name. We want to say that it's a headshot. Um, just by saying it's a headshot, you can convey several things about that image and the person behind it. Maybe they're professional, likely wearing a business suit um, or business casual, and they're almost certainly smiling. Um, but you don't need much more than that. If the person is doing something in the photo, describe it. You know, are they holding an award? Are they leaning against the tree? Um, do they have their fingers in their mouth? But you don't want to over-describe the person. You don't want to describe everything, um, especially if assumptions are made around gender identity, socioeconomics, uh, sexual expression, race. Leave those descriptions out of your alternative text for individual people unless it's truly communicating important information that cannot be accessed any other way for those who cannot see the photo. And I want to back up a little bit to, to where I'm saying to say that it's a headshot. Now, if you have a view, a Drupal view, and you have, you know, 50 headshots um, on a page, you might not want to put headshot there because you're going to say headshot of Amy June, headshot of Leslie Galen, and that might be redundant. Um, but if it's on a single page, um, definitely include that it's a headshot. Decorative images. So how would you describe this image? If an image is purely decorative and does not convey any meaning, there's a couple of different things that you can do to um, tell screen readers to ignore the image. Um, images can be decorative if they're like styling for borders or maybe they're spacers and corners. They're illustrative of text, but not contributing information or maybe they're identified and described by the surrounding text. So when can you skip writing alternative text? There are only two situations where an image can be considered decorative and therefore 
not needing the alternative text. If the information or if the image provides no important information or context, that's where it's on the page around it. Um, it can be considered decorative because its function is to enhance the appearance of the page. Um, the second um, case is um, it's repeated nearby on the page. You know, the exact information is communicated by, communicated by the image. Um, sometimes we see this in social media posts, like for a webinar card, um, the, the text of the social media post will have all of the information that's read on, on the image. So, um, but what I do for things like that, for alternative text, I'll say no new information. But these instances are pretty rare you will almost never have an image that does not need alternative text. When in doubt, it's always better to give more information than not enough. And think about why you have that image on the page. Is it to evoke emotion? If it's evoking emotion, then you're not describing it. Some of your, some of your um, content consumers aren't gonna have those same emotions. So really think about why you put that image on the page. So here we have a border, you know, this is a decorative image, um, not informative of all. Um, so I would skip alternative text for something like this. Images of text. Um, so how would you describe this image? Um, Readable text is sometimes presented within the image itself. If the image is not a logo, avoid text in images. But if you do use text in images, the alternative text should contain the same words as in the image. But when you think about it and you're on a web page, using actual text is more flexible than images. It can be resized without losing clarity. You know, your background and text colors can be modified to suit the reader. Um, images can become distorted when zoomed in and zoomed out. Um, but in those situations where images of text cannot be avoided, again, that alternative text must contain the same text as in the image. So I would describe this image, um, a Sony Walkman, um, the best 80s music, uh, VH1's 100 greatest songs of the 80s. So I described the image and I also had all of the, the words um, written out. Logos um, are images of text most of the time. So how would you describe this logo? You know, every logo needs alternative text. You want to say that the image is a logo? You know, assistive technology does not understand the difference between logos and other images. So using the word logo can help users understand the purpose. And we generally like to say to follow the format, having the organizational name and then logo. And then if there's anything else in the image, um, you want to include that. If there's any text in the image, you want to include that. You know, is your image also a link? Um, if your logo is a link, you need to follow best practices for linked images instead, and which is to include where the where the linked image is going. So here we have um, MTV music television logo. Groups of images. What are these? So how would you describe this image of a star rating? You know, we have. Um, uh, a bunch of stars and only some of them are filled in. So if multiple images convey a single piece of information, the text alternative for one image should convey the information for the entire group. So what does that mean? So I have this image of five stars. There's five, or I have five star images. So say there are four filled in stars and one quarter filled star indicating that overall rating. You can see it says four out of seven out of 4.7 out of five. So that first star text alternative would say rating 4.7 out of five stars and all of the other images would have that null, which is the two quotes. And I just want to be very clear here. This is Fugazi's Red album. This is a five out of five album, not 4.7 out of five. CAPTCHAs. Anybody know what CAPTCHA stands for? I had to look it up when I first started learning about alternative text. It is completely automated public touring test to tell computers and humans apart. CAPTCHA. 
It's a type of challenge that we use on websites to determine if the user is a robot. Um, <clears throat> the first series of CAPTCHAs that came around on the internet were completely inaccessible. Not everyone can see the screen. And if you think about it, alternative text defeats the purpose of weeding out machines because they're able to parse it. Um, so we need to think about how we plan for, 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 for CAPTCHAs. You can see this is one of the old CAPTCHAs here, and it's asking uh, me to identify, um, to type the words. And I have Guns and Roses sucks, so I would type that into that little bar there. But it also has an alternative um, where you can hear it and then type it. So you, this has it, this is a pretty good CAPTCHA because it gives two alternative ways to access that information. Again, not everyone can see the screen. Um, so you wanna make sure you offer alternatives to CAPTCHAs that are accessible, including people with low vision, hearing, and neurocognitive disabilities. So if we think about user input, we wanna make sure that we have no single way to um, input or access the information. Um, if it's a question, you wanna make sure that it's a simple question. Um, if it's a math problem, you know, think about people who live with dyscalculia, you know, math can be a problem too. And these like click the ones that are a flower, not everyone can identify what a flower is. Not everyone can identify, you know, what a bridge is, um, you know, but a lot of the, the captions these days are a checkbox that says, are you human? And those are great. We have complex images. These are our graphs, charts, diagrams. They contain too much information to be effectively used um, using alternative text. So these images can be described with a long description. You know, our long descriptions are more detailed descriptions that provide um, mostly equivalent access to the information on the page. But also we wanna think about this question um, Given the current context, what information is this image intended to communicate? If you're only trying to communicate one bit of the information, you don't have to include all of what's on that image. The same information must be provided to people who are unable to see the image. So have some discretion there. If you're like highlighting one month, this is a, a, a chart of you know the hot hundred singles of the month. If you're highlighting like a week, and that's the information you're trying to convey, you, you can just include that in your alternative text. And um, be mindful that if you have to have, um, if it's a table or a chart or an org tree, a, um, uh, you might have to include some of that structure in your alternative text, you know, including the lists and the data tables and the headings and the columns. So how would you describe this complex image? This is an infographic for, 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 a, for a concert. Infographics often communicate important information to the user that screen readers aren't able to recognize. And then there's a flow to it too. Um, you wanna include all the text that, incur, that occurs within the image. Um, consider removing the text from your image and inserting it as live text on the page. Um, your alternative text should include all the text. And I always say that. And account for layout again. Um, the order of information can be crucial to understanding the message. So be sure to describe the layout of your graphic where the text is placed in relation to the image in addition to the whole of the content. So here we have a concert flyer for the descendants. They're playing five nights at the Whiskey Club. Um, October 8th, they're playing with Blink-182, and I can go down and talk about Lagwagon and Strung Out. Um, and then I want to also include that Milo is reading a magazine that says everything sucks. Code can be a complex image, and we want to use code images of code really sparingly. It's not possible to copy and paste, so try to use code blocks instead of images. And again, if you do use code, the alt text should be that of the images of text. So explain the code, have it go line by line. Um, images of code blocks on a computer um, are decorative and serve no purpose. Just have a code block. Functional images, these are our buttons and things. And there's some rules around um, 
alternative text for these. Uh, most of them are the same as what I had on the first couple slides. But remember, we sometimes use these as links. So we want to make sure that the purpose of the link is clear and that the users know the context around, around the link. So image maps, these can contain those multiple clickable areas. These are our org charts. These are our pa park maps. These are our decision trees. Um, the text alternative for an image that it contains multiple clickable areas should provide an overall context for the whole set of links. Um, and again, you know, I always like to say things a few times to really drive it home. Um, linked images require alt text no matter what, um, and they have more considerations. Um, you can never mark a linked image as decorative um, because it's serving a purpose. It might be decorative, but it has a function, and you'll need to write the alt text of the image if it's a link. You must include any uh, um, all the text in the image, um, uh, but also consider what's around it. You know, you don't have to repeat any of the information around it, um, but describe the additional um, visual information the image is communicating. And you want to avoid. Um, having your alternative text start with link to or click this um, because screen readers automatically identify it as a link or that it's clickable. So writing words like link to or click to is redundant and confusing for people navigating the page with a screen reader. And you can see that this is a map. Um, you can see that there's multiple clickable areas. And again, you know, you would use that alt text that would, would describe all of them, you know, like this is a uh, icon is a link to restaurants. So how would you describe this image? It's an icon. It's a functional icon. Um, it's an icon for a file format. Um, so you would want to make sure that you convey information within that link text, where it's going, what it's going to open, and that it's an icon. We have um, images used in a button. Um, these are functional image. The image is used to give the button a distinct style. So you could say, um, you know, uh, the search button. Um, you don't necessarily have to describe the image unless it adds that value, you know, that, um, that emotional value. So I would say uh, late 80s colored themed um, search uh, magnifying glass. We have standalone icons. Um, this is a picture of a printer. So you want to say when you click this button that it's going to go um, and go to print. And we have miscellaneous images. Um, we have screenshots. Um, this is a screenshot of um, a back of a of an audio board. Um, generally, you add visual explanation visual explanations to the text and how to's with screenshots um, makes sometimes it helps to, to say that it's a screenshot when you begin. Illustrations. Um, be sure to describe what adds value. You know, why is it important for content consumers to know that it's an illustration? So we have um, a drawing of Madonna illustration um, from the late 80s. Um, but why is that important? You know, um, because maybe it's an op piece about a, a, an art opening, you know. Um, so sometimes it's important to, to 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 say that it's an illustration. Go over some do's and don'ts real quick. Um, we talked about some of these. Don't begin with image of or picture of. People will already know that it's an image. Please do not use the file name as your alternative text. Screenshot. Dot, dot JPEG does not serve any purpose. Um, don't be too wordy. Don't rely on artificial intelligence because they don't always get it right. Um, don't use a space for alternative text. If you don't want to include alternative text and it's decorative, you just want to do those two quotes. And avoid emoji icons and alternative text. Um, use plain text, free of symbols, icons, and any weird special characters. Um, so some of the do's, you know, describe the location, talk about what the colors are going on, 
you know, the feelings, the emotions, uh, who is present, what, what, what are people doing, um, the purpose of the image, and anything that's actively happening. Because not all descriptions are created equal. WCAG documentation is sort of a one size fits all for authoring um, image descriptions. But we do keep in mind that descriptions need to be responsive to the context of where it's found. And we'll look at this picture from 99 red, red balloons. The same photo could appear on three different pages and require three different alternative texts. Um, the alt text for an image can vary depending on the context, the role on the page, or the intended message. There are times when this image is um, an image of a woman walking across a field. But other times, it might be a woman walking across a field with smoke from explosions in the background. Or it could be that there's a storm rolling in. Same image, but three different uses. So I have some fun examples that we're going to go through. Um, so what do you think of when you hear the phrase, men with makeup? So we have this image of men with makeup. I'm not going to describe them the first time I show them. Or we have this image of men with makeup. So if we look at them again, here's that same picture, men with makeup, but I'll, our alternative text is better now. And we're saying the faces of the music group kiss in their stage makeup. And then we bring in that other picture and we can see that it's David Bowie with a red and blue lightning bolt on his face. They're both images of men with makeup but they're very different images. We've got Rio. So here's a picture of Rio. And here's another picture of Rio. Now let's add better alternative text. So we have the iconic statue of Christ the Redeemer looking over the city of Rio de Janeiro. And then we have Duran Duran's album cover, Rio, by the artist Patrick Nagel. Who here's a fun one, dead bug. What do you think of when you hear the phrase dead bug? Well, that's an image of a dead bug, but so is this one. So let's add our, our alternative text. So we have a bug on a leaf carrying a stack of dead bugs on its back, or we have a Volkswagen Beetle with a Grateful Dead logo on its hood, both dead bugs. Now we've got Paul Revere. What do we think of when we think of Paul Revere? Well, um, there's this image and there's this one. Both are Paul Revere, but both very different. So with alternative text, we have statue of Paul Revere in a park on his horse. And then we have Def Jam record label of Beastie Boys song, Paul Revere, and it's the new style. So we've got flock of seagulls. Here's a flock of seagulls and here's a flock of seagulls. But if we add alternative text, we can see that it's a flock of seagulls flying against a bright blue sky or the band of flock of the band flock of seagulls posing with 80 styles clothes and hairstyles. I think I've just got a couple more. We've got ACDC. Here's a picture of ACDC and there's a picture of ACDC. And with alternative text, we have AC is a tilde over a line, DC is a line over a dashed line. And we're talking about power here, ACDC. But we're also talking about power here when we talk about the band ACDC with Malcolm Young in the front. And I think this is the last one. We have The Cure. So here's a picture of The Cure. And here's a picture of The Cure. Again, Someone holding a tray of pills versus the Cure's Kiss Me, Kiss Me, Kiss Me album with shiny red lips on the cover. So I'm going to um, <clears throat> try to wrap things up. So bottom line, be succinct, be thoughtful of what information you're actually wanting to portray, add the details that are relevant, and also think about why the image is there. Why, why is it there in the first place? Why, what is important for people who can access it visually? Those are the details you need to share in the alternative text. So we'll go a little bit over social media because lots of us do social media. Um, 
Accessibility should be across all platforms. Um, and why write accessible content for social media? 88% of people use a screen reader on a mobile device and only 54% found it somewhat accessible. Remember those numbers we had at the beginning? A quick win to bring up the percentage um, of the accessibility of our images is to add alternative text. So there are ways to do alternative text in all of these um, platforms, but they're not usually turned on by default. So you have to kind of dig into the, to the advanced settings. Um, you can see here that this is a stop AAPI hate. Um, and I don't even know what platform this is, uh, but that's okay, that's irrelevant. But the, 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 the thing I'm trying to convey is, uh, a quick search on the internet can usually yield real good articles on how to do alternative text in all these social media platforms. You can see that um, it's available in Facebook these days. We have it in Instagram, you know, but you do have to dig in and you have to click the accessibility button and write out your alt text. Um, you can see that it's, well, I guess it's X now. Um, there's alternative text for X. There's alternative text in LinkedIn, you know, so all of these platforms have it. They're just not generally on by default, or you have to click into the image to write the alternative text. And since there's only seven minutes left, I'm not going to go into the bonus material of the slideshows, um, but we'll post the link in, in the chat or on the website, and y'all can go back and look at the stuff I have to say about slideshows. So thank you. Thanks, Amy June. I think that's uh, uh, probably the tenth or twelfth um, accessibility presentation I've seen, and I like learn something new every time. Um, right. It's there's always something new to learn, and the standards are changing all the time. So, thanks so much for the overview, and um, we have a question in Q and A. But I just wanted to start off by just. Um, noticing like when you were giving the examples of men with makeup, like, I think it's really important. Like it takes probably five seconds to just think about it one layer deep, more deep, and just think about it in the context that you were providing. And I thought that was really powerful. Like it really isn't that much harder to like describe it in a way that's actually useful instead of just filling in the blank and checking that box. Right. Um, I thought that was really great. Um, the other thing um, I just wanted to know, are any of the social platforms or any of the platforms in general that you upload images to, do they ever require alt tags? Like, and, and no. if, if not, why, why not? I None of them require it. And that's a good mm -hmm. question. Um, but there's, I think there's these bots that you can use, these accounts. Um, I know on, I don't use Twitter X anymore, but I like subscribe to an account after I posted it, it would be like, hey, you didn't have alt text on your image. And I'd be like, oh, crap. And I'd go a crud and go back and I would add it, you know, but no, none of them are required. So, yeah. And yeah. Buffer, Maybe. Buffer, if you're doing like your scheduling ahead of time, it's not required either. But just so you know, if you do a scheduler, like something like Buffer, there's a space to add alternative text there too. And there's a space to add alternative te text to, um, gifts not all yeah. the platforms have that so that's something yeah. nice about some of those scheduling pl platforms is they kind of dig another layer down for you that's cool i mean i guess uh you know one consideration even though it, you mentioned it's probably pretty rare is that for an image that isn't uh doesn't communicate any information you wouldn't necessarily want to require it but i don't know i think that's something to think about um we have a question from Jessica. Uh, her question is, how can organizations balance the need for control and flexibility in CMSs when alt text may not always be required? Uh, additionally, how should responsibilities be divided between developers and content editors in determining when alt text is necessary and what it should contain? Okay, well, that goes to your style guide um, as an organization. If you work for an organization, I would 
I would like to work for an organization that has a style guide and that way everyone can align with it. And as far as like developers versus our content entry, developers don't have much in there. You know, they're doing the code um, and hardly ever touch the content. Um, but what's hard in Drupal, and maybe there's a, a solution that I don't know of, but you know, when we add images to our image libraries and we add alternative text, and then we go in there and we use that image in different places. And now all of a sudden I have that alternative text for page four, but my page five, that alternative text isn't appropriate. You know, so there's things like that to think about too when we have image libraries and, um, you know, do you want to upload an image twice and have two different versions so you can have two different versions of alternative text? But it really comes down to the basics of, and this is where I can like talk for a long time. Talk about what is the message you're trying to get across? Is it just decorative? You know, if you if you just have an image there to break up your content, you, that's fine. You know, say that it's a house on a hill, right? But again, if that house on a hill has a kid sitting in front of it or a gravestone or a flagpole, those important images add that, that context. So I'm not sure I answered the question, but... I would say as a team, like really talk about the style guide part of it. That's great. Um, anyone else with questions for and, Amy June? Um, some content creators or content um, editors might not know how to make an image decorative if it's required. When we have a required field and you want to you, you want to mark it decorative, you can just put two quotes in there, and that that tells the screen reader that it's empty. So some people will put like one word, like a picture just to get around that. But there is a way to, you know, do the two quotes and that will tell the screen reader that that is a decorative image. Ah, I didn't know that. Is it is that different from just not putting anything? You can't if it's a required field. Yeah. Sure, yeah. sure, sure. But I've seen people like put a period in there or something just to get around that. But yeah, it's two quotes will make the screen reader. Um, no. Nice pro tip there. I like that. Um, we have another question from Rachel. Uh, if your image has different context in different places, should you give the image a different file name? Sure. Because that'll get you around that media library. But again, it's that same image taking up space. You know, I don't have a good solution for that. But um, sometimes when you upload an image, you can change the alternative text right there. And sometimes you can't, it depends on your platform and how your developers coded it. Um, but that might be easier for your content um, editors having a different file name. They'll know that, oh, this is the red barn or this is the red barn with the cemetery in front. You know, that might help them know which one to load into the, into the article. Uh, one more question, two more questions, and then we'll wrap it up. It's um, right at time here. Um, appreciate everybody sticking around, if you can. Uh, Eileen asks, at times we develop content that highlights or targets historically marginalized groups or people of certain race, ethnicity, or background. Is there something that should be, is that something that should be incorporated into alternative text? It depends. Um, it depends on... If it's important to the story, it depends on how important it is to you. That is one that I don't have the answer for. But if you're writing an alternative piece or an op-ed piece about, you know, um, inner city Black youth, that might be really important to describe race in some of those images. You know, if you have a white man with a baseball bat attacking, you know, some Black youth, definitely include that. But if, you know... It, it really depends on who you talk to because I've like, as I've been doing this, it's changed how people do it's changed um, where people do it. Lo locality change, you know, like some people would say, you know, a young black woman and professional or when some people will just say a professional woman, you know, so it really is up to it's always changing. And I don't have the answer to that, really. Yeah, it really depends on the context. Mm -hmm. Um. Other question, last question uh, from Anonymous. Uh, not really a question, just regarding Drupal Media. So they say, I guess we don't have a solution for that media reference yet. The solution would not be using media and use the image field instead. It would 
be great though if we had functionality to override the alt text in the next context mm -hmm. and then they actually posted a link um, it looks like this kind of override alt works on WYSIWYG though so it looks like there's maybe some work being done in the oh, great. WYSIWYG field kind of uh, realm great great learn something new yeah thank you all right um I think that wraps it up uh Amy June thank you so much and Leslie uh, any last thoughts? I just wanted to thank Amy June so much for sharing all her knowledge and experience uh, with with our audience. It's, you know, really appreciate that. Really appreciate you taking the time to do that. So thank, thank you. you. It's always fun. That was great to see you. Thank you, everybody. And we'll see you soon. All right. Thanks, all.